Let's all stand. We would like to welcome each and every one of you to Eagle Bend Apostolic Church, whether you're here with us or you're watching us by the way of the web. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Isaiah, and we will be reading out chapter 9, verse 6. Didn't the children do a wonderful job this morning? Praise God. Praise God. It was very anointed. Praise God. Are we there? All right. Praise God. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And this is the good part here. And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we worship you tonight. Lord, let everything we do here tonight uplift and glorify your holy name. Lord, anoint the worship team, Lord. As your word goes forth tonight, let us be changed. Lord, we don't want to leave here the same as we came, Lord. We worship and praise your name. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. The one true king has come. Father's only son came down for all of us to conquer the world with love. The promise turned to flesh, the prophet's words to sin. Our Savior has come to earth with freedom for all the world. Let heaven and nature sing Praise to the newborn King Christmas is all about the Father's love for us Join with the angels on high Sing with the saints in the choir Christmas is all about the Father's love for us, a major made a throne to welcome heaven's son. The universe roars with praise when Jesus is born this day. Let heaven and nature sing praise to the newborn King. Christmas is all about. 
of you, Lord. Hallelujah. Can we give him praise? God, we thank you that you are mine. God, that you are ours tonight, Lord. Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We love you. We praise you, mighty God. Come on, we can do just a little better than that for just a moment here. Amen. We serve a good God. We serve a great God. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for the God that we serve and, for, and how good he is. Amen. Amen. Right now, while we're in the spirit, I, I, I have a special prayer request I want to bring to us tonight. Sister Tanya Stukesbury is, is suffering with severe pneumonia. Um, and and it's, it's to the point she called me today and asked that we would have special prayer. This is the third time since June she's had pneumonia, and this is the worst case of it that she's had. And so she has asked us to pray. And, and uh, as you may recall, a few weeks ago, or maybe a couple weeks ago, uh, I came and brought Pastor Triplett to you, and, and I asked us just to take a few moments. Uh, if you want to walk around, Neil, but I wanted us to, to get in touch with heaven on behalf of Pastor Triplett. And lo and behold, he's standing here tonight. And God did a miraculous work in his life. And I know he can do the same for Sister Tanya. And so right now I want us to, I want us to touch heaven tonight. And I want us to do it on behalf of Sister Tanya Stooksbury. Can we do that tonight? Hallelujah. God, we love you tonight, Jesus. God, we come before you humbly, mighty God. God, we worship you. We thank you, God, for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. God, I thank you for every time you've, you've answered my prayer. God, for every, every miracle, for every healing. God, for every answer. And God, right now, I bring Sister Tanya to you, Lord. God, I lift her name up to the throne room tonight. God, we come before you, mighty God. Jesus, I pray that you would touch Sister Tanya. God, that you would touch Sister Tanya tonight. God, that you would move right now in that room. God, that you would step in. God, send your angels, Lord, to minister to her body. God, this pneumonia in her lungs. God, I rebuke that sickness. God, I pray that you would cast it out of her body. Lord, I pray for her to overcome this. God, we're not asking. God, I'm asking for a miracle right now. God, an instant healing. God, I pray that you would help her to recover instantly, God. God, we've come before. I remind you, God, that you touched Pastor Triplett. And God, I'm praying that you would touch Sister Tanya right now. God, that you would move, Lord. We know you're able. We know you're able, mighty God. And we're petitioning you right now in the name of Jesus that it will be done. That your will be done, mighty God. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Amen, amen. I'm glad to have a God that we know hears our prayers. That at any point we can take our needs, take our prayers to him, and he will hear our prayers. Amen, amen. It's so good to see all of you here tonight. And so, so glad all that are joining us by way of the web. I'm going to let you be seated for just a moment. Amen, it's just a good day to be in the house of God. It's just been a good day all the way around. Our kids did a, a phenomenal job. And I, I give honor to, to all those that directed. But there are so many more working behind the scene than just the few that I named this morning. And so I give honor to all that helped, that all, to all that, that made uh, that sacrifice. So I thank you parents for having your kids here, bringing them to practices on Saturdays, having them here early this morning. I thank all of you for all of your work and sacrifice and making what happened this morning happen. Amen. This coming Wednesday night is our annual Christmas banquet, and this will take place in our Family Life Center at 7 p.m. I make note it is at 7 p.m. Our normal Wednesday night service time is when we will is when our Christmas banquet will begin, and uh, we're asking you to sign up for tables. There is a sign up sheet in the lobby. Um, I guess tonight's probably the last night you can do so unless you want to stop by during the week. So I ask that before you leave, if you're planning to be here, to sign up for a table. Uh, that way we can make sure that we, it helps us 
two to know how many people are coming. But no matter how many are coming, I'm cooking multiple hams and turkeys this year. And so there's going to be plenty of meat. Somebody was asking, what happens if it canceled? I said, I got hams and turkeys I'm cooking. So if you want to show up, we're going to eat. Uh, yeah. So y'all, y'all come on. We're, we're, as, as, far as, I, as far as I can tell, we're going to be here. And, uh, and I'm excited about it. I'm excited about having a good time of fun, food, and fellowship. There is no cost to come or be a part of it. However, donations are welcome. And so we hope you all will join us this coming Wednesday, December the 16th at 7 p.m. Next Sunday, December 20th, Brother Mike Wilson will be here in our 11.15 a.m. service. And he will be doing a Christmas piano concert. And uh, we are very much looking forward to this. Also next Sunday, we will have the Christmas baskets ready. Many of some have signed up already for those. These, this is a Christmas basket with uh, food, a uh, full, full Christmas meal, whether it be for, for, for you or for someone that you may know in need, you can sign up and we will have those ready. Uh, this was a, a tremendous blessing to the Towers Church. Um, Pastor Gwen said he's been, continued to get calls, even from the staff there, that uh, people have been coming up and, and asking them to, to contact us or reach out to Pastor Gwen just to say thank you, that they felt like so many had forgot about them during all of this. And so just that little act of kindness uh, has, has meant so much to those people. And I'm looking forward to doing it again next Sunday. And so I know we had many that helped uh, prepare baskets. Uh, If you want the opportunity again, we'll use all the help we can get. Uh, We had several, we had a few couples that went over with the Gwens to carry because they carried, I think, 45 baskets over there um, to give away. And so that's, that's a lot for just pastor and sister Gwen. And so we sent a few people over there to help. And so if you helped last time and want to help again, awesome we'll let you uh if you didn't help last time but you want to help this time just let us know and we can get you involved because it is a lot of work uh, but it is definitely worth the blessing that comes along with it of being able to bless all these different people and as always you can find everything that we announce and more on our bulletin i'm going to ask our ushers to make their way right now excited about tonight i've been looking forward to it uh, as we get to hear uh, again from from a young minister of ours brother jacob kaiser he has been doing a, a phenomenal job, and I guess it was a couple weeks ago he preached out for the first time and, and went and preached for Brother Andy Hozak at Crossroads Apostolic Church. Uh, he had reached out to me and asked about having Brother Jacob, and he, he went on and on about what a tremendous job Brother Jacob has done. And so I thank him for all that he is doing, for his dedication to the Lord, and also for representing us well as he's gone out to other churches in our area. And so I give him honor tonight. I'm going to ask you to stand. We pray over our offering together. If you would, lift your hand and pray with me now. Upon the authority of your word, I have given, and it shall be given back to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked. The curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing that there is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interests and incomes, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, debts demolished, and royalties received my whole family saved and walking with god perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing i am blessed going in and i am blessed going out all that i do will prosper in jesus name amen can we give the lord a hand clap of praise Amen. We invite you this evening to march and give your tithes and offering as the music plays under the direction of our ushers at this time.
ask you to stand one more time this evening in honor of the, the Word of God and the man of God this evening. As I've already said, how, how proud I am of Brother Jacob and all that God is doing in his life and for the, the call of God that he's answered on his life. And I wonder if we can give Brother Jacob and the Lord a good hand tonight as he makes his way to this pulpit. Praise the Lord, church. How many are glad to be in the house of God tonight? Praise the Lord. How many of you happy about this Christmas season? And it's always, it's always a very humbling time of year when I think about what God has done for us. You know, God could have been born. You know, he could have come into this world in any way. He could have come, you know, riding on a cloud, riding on a white horse, you know, through the skies, blazing fire everywhere. But he came as humble as could be. He came as a baby born in a manger and laid in a feeding trough, born to a carpenter and a virgin, you know, a, a woman who wasn't even married yet. He came in about as humble as he could come. And I believe that's a testament to what God wants for us is to humble ourselves so that he may be exalted through us. Praise God. As that's nothing to do with, with my sermon tonight, but it's just, it's just a happy thought that God has laid on me that I'm glad to share with y'all. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. And before I read my opening scripture, I just want to give a little bit of context. As the Lord prophesied through Isaiah in chapter 49... He spoke from the messianic role, which we know as, which we know that the Messiah is God made flesh in order to set an example for us how to live and to die for us on the cross to pay for our sins because without it, we would be eternally separated from God. And then he rose three days later to prove his victory over sin and death. In Isaiah chapter 49, the Messiah spoke of being called from his mother's womb. He spoke of being a tool and vessel used by God. And he spoke of being the glory of God all before coming to our opening scripture. And now let's read. And it says, And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the sorry and restore the preserved of Israel I also will give thee for a light to the gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth Now I'm not going to preach about Christmas tonight but I'm going to preach about Jesus which is who what Christmas is all about Amen. So God said it is light or small or easy that he should raise up Israel only. God wanted his salvation to reach the Gentiles, not just the people of that time, but unto the end of the earth or until the time as or until the end of all time as we currently understand it. And it is from this thought that I draw my title for this evening, Revival Unto the End of the Earth. Now set your Bibles down and let's lift our hands and our voices to God. Pastor, would you lead us in prayer? We love you. We praise you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you're going to do. Be glorified and honored, Jesus. Bless your name, mighty God. We pray, Lord, that you would move in this place, oh God. Anoint me to bring your word, Jesus. Let me say nothing but your word, God. Help us to receive it. Mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. You may be seated at this time. I'm going to take just a moment to compare the first few verses of Isaiah 49 to our lives. The, the Messiah was called from the womb, and all people are called by God, but it is up to each individual to answer that call. 
We've read that it is not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God calls each and every one of us, and it is up to us to answer it. The Messiah was a tool or vessel used by God to bring about the Lord's will. And aren't we also called to be pure and holy vessels, to be used however God sees fit? The Messiah brought glory to God. Aren't we also supposed to let God's glory shine through us? I don't compare us to Jesus to puff up ourselves or our own importance because there's not a one of us who could sacrifice our lives to pay for our own sins, let alone the whole world. But I make this comparison to emphasize how much God cares about us and why he calls us to be like him. God wants us to be like him because he wants a relationship. That was his purpose for all of creation was to have a people that would be like him so that he could love them and that they would love him back. And that being said, I would like to compare our opening scripture about the Messiah to what to the words of Paul in Acts chapter 13 verse 47. And it says, For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like we read it two minutes ago or something like that. And it is nearly word for word to what we read. It is nearly word for word to what God said about our Savior. As followers of Christ, we are to be a light unto salvation to those who have not yet been adopted into God's family. We are necessary for the salvation of lost souls, not in the sense that we can save anyone by our own means. But it is up to us to testify of the goodness of God and to tell lost people how to know our Lord Jesus. Amen? It is the calling of God unto the end of the earth. This means as long as this earth is still spinning, the saints of God are to be winning souls all over the earth. We are to further God's kingdom, and we will never reach a point of being good enough. As long as there are still lost souls in this world, there will never be a point where God tells us that we've reached enough people that we don't need to worry about the rest. We are to give, we are to give our all to God until we have no more to give. Our responsibility is to further the kingdom of God. And this responsibility passes from generation to generation. Bishop McCool poured into Pastor Triplett. Pastor Triplett founded this church and passed the torch on to Pastor Miller. And each generation is responsible for reaching further than the last one did. Our work isn't over just because we have enough members paying tithes to keep the lights on and a preacher in the pulpit. We are called to further the kingdom of God, not just maintain it. The people of God are to bring salvation unto the end of the earth. This is for all time, and this is in the other sense of the end of the earth, to be all over the earth. We need to reach every soul that we can. Now, I will say there is coming a day when each of us will have completed our work. It will either be the day that we die or the day that the Lord returns. I don't know which is coming first, but I do know that I am to reach people until one of those two days comes. We've determined the need to further the kingdom. And though I don't know when exactly the, earth, the end of the earth will be, I don't know how long we will be furthering the kingdom. I do know that there is a lot, to work, a lot of work to do. Jesus said, the harvest is great and the laborers are few. I do know that this world grows by roughly 385,000 babies every day. How are we to reach the entire world when it is growing so quickly, so rapidly? And the answer is one we've all heard before, one that we've all been very familiar with. 
The answer is we need revival. And what I mean by that is not just a good service every now and then. Not just a move of God as the same people come in week to week. We need the Spirit of God to touch our innermost being and truly change us and who we are and how we work in His kingdom. I realize that one church cannot reach the entire world, but we can impact the entire world. If we do our job here, if we get revival burning here strong and true, it can touch our neighboring churches and it can keep on spreading throughout the ends of the earth and from generation to generation until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Man, church, this gets me excited. I'm, I fully believe that revival is coming. I fully believe we are on the doorsteps of revival. If we can just reach a little bit further, push a little bit harder, we can receive what God wants to give us. We can see an outpouring of His Spirit like we have never seen before. Praise God. But I'm not interested in just saying that we need revival. I love to shout about it. But I want to do more than just say what we need. I want to help us get there. Amen. And I know each and every one of you do too. We can be the change that our world needs if we will follow the word of God. So how are we going to have this revival? The Lord gives us a few keys throughout his word that can bring change into the world. If we will not just read them and not just know them but to truly apply them to our lives. We will start by reading in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, to see what these keys are. It says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. This was Jesus talking to his disciples, his followers, after his resurrection. And he told them that they needed the Holy Spirit. They needed to wait until they received the Spirit of God in their lives. And we are going to have to have the Spirit of God in our lives if we are going to bring on this great revival. The first key, as I said, is to recognize the needs. It is our need to be close to God. And we have to realize that revival isn't just something we want. It isn't just something that would be neat or enjoyable. It is a need for us to be the church of the one true living God. I know Jesus was just talking to a few people, but that does not mean that the need was only for them. The need is, was not limited to them. This was merely his starting point. Let's read Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 39. Peter had just finished preaching to the crowd who Jesus was, that he was the promised Messiah who came, for, who came to die for their sins and bridge the gap between man and God as prophesied in the Old Testament. So verse 37 through 39 says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. They said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Praise God. Praise God. The people asked what they needed to do. Because they understood that what Peter preached was truth. They understood that Jesus was the Messiah. And so he told them exactly what they needed to do. He told them to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. 
And he told them that they would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he told them that this promise just wasn't to them on that day 2,000 years ago. But it was to all that are far off. Somebody say all. all. Praise God. These, there is a need for all people of all time all over the earth to know God. Peter did his job and passed the responsibility to the next generation. And that generation to the next. So on and so forth. Until this generation today. And as we've already established, there is still a need for revival today. The world is growing faster than the churches, and we need to catch up. We need to reach these lost souls. But it's something that we cannot do on our own. It has has to be a move of God, because we are not powerful enough on our own. And it can't just be, and though we identify it as a need, it cannot be something we just know. As I said, it must be something that is personal to us. It must be something that we require for ourselves, something that we personally desire. And so, to elaborate on this, I would like to read 2 Peter chapter 2, or 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9 in the NLT. It says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise. That promise referring to his return, as, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but he wants everyone to repent. The Lord's desire for everyone is for everyone to repent. And if we are truly the body of Christ, that is also our desire. It is not just another job or another duty that we must fulfill. It is our own personal passion to see as many people as possible saved and living for God. And we are, if we are God's children, we have no choice but to desire the sharing of his word, of his good news. Because if we do not share it, who will? People are not going to repent and turn to God unless they know they need to. And people will not know they need to unless we tell them of our God and how great and wonderful he is and the great blessings he has in store for his children. So we must make this our desire for revival if we are going to see it. And desire goes hand in hand with the next key to revival. All throughout the Bible we read about how faith is necessary. Jesus told us that we could ask for anything in his name, and if we believe that we have received it, we will. We are told that without faith, it is impossible to please God. And we are children of the God, of the one true God. It is our place to trust him and love him and believe his word and believe what he said. God is faithful to us even more He's not just faithful to us when we are faithful to him. I mean, God has been much better to us than we could ever be to him. I know God has worked in my life and called out to me and tugged on me when I was actively rebelling against him. It was the hand of God that drew me back in. And if he has been this faithful to us, if God has forgiven all of our sins and made a way for us for our sakes... How much more will he make a way for his will, for reaching others who are just like how we were, who did not know God? So we must trust in him, and we will see his spirit move in miraculous ways. We will see the great and mighty revival if we believe God to bring it to us. And I would like to take just a moment to testify about the power faith and desire have together. A couple of months ago, I had the privilege of attending a Bible study with several young men um, of varying doctrines and beliefs, all, all Christian, but various denominations. And before going, I felt that most of the young men who would be there did not hold, hold the same beliefs that we do. 
as far as the oneness of God and the necessity of repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And when I got there, I found out I was correct, but that did not hinder the Spirit of God. Most of them did not believe the oneness of God or the necessity of repentance, water, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And I'd been praying throughout that day for a move of God leading up to the Bible study. And there certainly was a move of God, but it was not due to my prayers. There was more. I saw a beautiful testimony of God's goodness during that Bible study. The man leading that Bible study decided to do things out of their usual order. And what he did was he just had all of us begin to pray. There was, I don't know, 18 or 20 of us, and we just all prayed together at the same time while, aloud while we were scroll, or flipping through the Bible, reading, trying to understand what God would speak to us that evening. And as we prayed, I began to feel the Spirit move. And I could feel, and all the other young men there could feel the Spirit move as well. And God began to speak through these young men. They would read His Word, and God would speak. And He would share things that I had never thought about, though I read the very same scriptures on more than one occasion. And we truly had, and we were truly led by the Spirit. And though most of them did not hold our same apostolic beliefs and values, the Spirit was not hindered because they had faith and a desire to know God, a faith and, and a desire to feel the presence of God. And it was during that Bible study, in response to their faith and my faith and the faith of us all there together, trusting in the Lord, that the Lord moved mightily. He moved more powerfully than I felt in many of our own apostolic church services. There was literally the sound of a rushing wind as God's Spirit moved upon us and spoke through us. Praise God. I began to pray in the Spirit, and there were, there were maybe, I don't know, two others who had who had also received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and they began to pray in the Spirit. And the Lord led me in preaching to them a message from the book of Acts chapter 19. If you're not familiar with that story, go home and read it tonight. It is where Paul came to John's disciples and asked them if they had received the gift of the Holy Ghost and if they had been baptized in Jesus' name. And they hadn't, and then... They were baptized in Jesus' name and received the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the Lord led me through this passage of Scripture to preach the salvation message to them. And as I said before, there were other young men who began to pray through in the Spirit. Praise God. And I tell you, it wasn't, it wasn't because I'm a good preacher. Y'all can probably tell... Until that Pastor Miller pumped me up and, and here I am trying to struggle through my notes. But it wasn't, it wasn't any of my doing. It was God responding to the faith and desire to see him. Praise God. Praise the Lord. And I know that we will see a wonderful move of God. And I'm not saying... That God responds to faith and desire so that we can dismiss our doctrines and our standards. We still need to believe in the oneness of God and baptism in Jesus' name, repentance and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Praise God. This is just an example of God's faithfulness. You know, we have been called to a higher standard because God has revealed more to us. The Bible teaches that to whom much is given, much will be required. So it is up to us to uphold these truths that we have been given and reach a world. There are many, many souls out there who want to know God like we know God. They have a true love and desire to live in one accord with God, but they don't know because no one has taught them. 
And speaking of a move of God, I would like to read the very beginning of what I like to refer to as the first revival. We will read Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. I turned too many pages. And it says, When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Praise God. God was moving 2,000 years ago and he's still moving today. Praise God. I would like to see, I would like to see an outpouring of his spirit where 120 at one time received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We can still see that today. We can still work towards that. Praise God. And so if we are going to see this, let's, let's look at at what was happening here and what God, what these people were doing to bring upon the presence of God. The first thing I would like to address is unity. It says they were all with one accord in one place. With one accord means they were of the same purpose. They were of the same mind. They had the same goal and that was to see the Holy Spirit fall. At that time, they did not know what it would be. But the Spirit of God fell upon them because they were seeking Him fervently. And they were seeking Him together. It says they were all in one place. They weren't just together. They just weren't together in what they wanted. They were literally together. The Word of God says not to forsake the gathering of yourselves. There is power. God answers our prayers when we pray on our own. But there's something different. There's something a little bit more powerful when we gather together as the body of Christ to seek Him with one mind. If we could all walk into the church building before every service, having already made up our minds that we are going to serve God, that we are going to seek Him, and if we come in expecting great things, if we have a faith and a desire to see a move of God, we will see it. And that's exactly what they did on the day of Pentecost. I'd also like to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, which I forgot to mark in my Bible or write out in my notes. So y'all are going to have to bear with me. There we go. It's right before Ephesians. Chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Does anyone know why we are to bear one another's burdens? Well, obviously it says to fulfill the law of Christ. But does anyone know why that's important? It's because we are of one body. We are the body of Christ. Amen. Jesus is the head. And he leads us, and we are his vessel. As a church, as a whole, we are to carry out the will of God and bring forth, and bring forth salvation unto many souls. And we are to bear each other's burdens because we are of the same body. You know, no matter how great my, my fingers are, they can't lift this bottle cap without being attached to my hand. And my hand can't help my fingers unless it's attached to my arm. And the arm to the shoulder and the shoulder to the body. We are all necessary for each other. That's why we must work together in one accord. And sometimes that requires a little bit of compromise. We have to give up some things that we want in order to work with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Praise God. Praise God. And we will walk together as one body in holiness, pursuing the will of God. You know, the reason we must be holy 
or holy means to be set apart for God. And the reason is, is because God isn't going to use something that isn't his. He's given us each our own lives. He's given us ownership of it. And in order to receive his salvation, we must give it back to him. So praise God. That is why we must walk in holiness because God cannot dwell with sin. God cannot dwell with us and work in us if we do not submit ourselves to his ways. And one thing, I'm sorry, two more things uh, that are keys unto revival. One of them is prayer and fasting. We have got to pray. We can look at revival all throughout history. The common theme amongst all of them is the amount of time people put into prayer and fasting. Before the day of Pentecost, it believes it is believed that there were 10 days between the time that Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. So imagine 10 days in the upper room praying, probably fasting as well. I don't know exactly what they did. I don't know if they had to go to work and then came in after work. But I do know that they spent a significant amount of time of their lives in the upper room for those 10 days. They were dedicated to seeking the will of God. They were dedicated to receiving his spirit, to receiving his power. They knew that the Holy Ghost was promised to them. And so they were going to do all that they could to see it come, to receive it. And that is what we must do. Imagine if 10 days of prayer in the upper room brought, it was about 120 people. If 10 days of 120 people praying, seeking the Spirit of God, brought forth the day of Pentecost, where 120 all received the Holy Ghost for the first time. Imagine what a hundred Holy Ghost filled people can do if we will dedicate ourselves to prayer for revival. If we will dedicate ourselves to praying and fasting and seeking revival and the Spirit of God to reign in our times. And time is the most valuable resource God has given us other than His Spirit. Time is the only resource that God has given every man and that we do not get back once we use. You can spend your money and earn more money, but you spend a second doing something that's not worthwhile and it's gone. I believe it is crucial that we remove some of the distractions and the busyness in our lives that keep us from pursuing the will of God, that keep us from pursuing the callings that God has on each and every one of us. The Bible teaches us to not to worry about the future. You know, as long as we have enough food and clothing for today, God, we can trust God to take care of the rest. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't make plans or you shouldn't work, but I'm saying do not be consumed with the future. Seek the will of God first. I mean, God, it is God's will for you to work and have a job and to provide for your family and all those things. But we must seek his will first. And he will lead us in all these things. And more importantly, he will lead us to the outpouring of his spirit more boldly and more powerfully than we've seen before. And before, or and as I get ready to close this evening, I've got one more key to revival I would like to share with us if the musicians want to make their way forward at this time. So who recalls at the day of Pentecost when Peter began to preach, after he preached repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost? Who recalls what happened then? What happened next was that... I'll go ahead and read it here for you. I didn't give them this scripture, so I'll just read it and y'all y'all just listen. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day 
there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So think about that. They spent time prayer and prayer and fasting and seeking the will of God in the upper room. And 120 received the gift of the Holy Ghost. 120 were added, were, became the church. And that was preparing them for what was to come. Preaching the word, which is what Peter did before 3,000 souls were added. Preaching is backed by prayer and fasting and study and seeking the word of God. And all of us are called to be, we are called to be a part of a priesthood that reaches this world. We are set apart for God. We are saints. Saints means holy one. And though we mess up, we dirty ourselves sometimes, we make mistakes, we are still called to be holy and set apart for God. And that is why we must study and we must pray. And not only that, we must preach the word of God. Would you all stand this evening as I read Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2? It says, The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light that dwell in the land of the shadow of death. Upon them hath the light shined. This, this is talking about the Messiah being the light for the world. But it is also talking about us. We are living in dark days. The world is more sinful and wicked than it ever has been and is continually waxing worse and worse. We are called to be that light. That is in the way we live and that is in the outreach of souls. We're called to lead and teach Bible studies. We're called to witness to people on the job. Praise God. We are, we are meant to do so much more than just come on Sundays and Wednesdays and pray. We pray throughout the week. We prepare for however God may choose to use us. We are the light of the world. And like on the day of Pentecost, if we prepare ourselves with prayer and fasting and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost... We too can reach our world and maybe 3,000 will join in one day. Who knows? Praise God. We can see great and mighty things. Powerful things will happen with the Spirit of God is working. I want to invite each and every one of you to gather around this altar tonight. And what we are going to do is that we are going to seek the will of God. We are going to seek a great and mighty revival. We are going to address the fact that we do have a need for revival and we're going to have faith and a desire to see the Holy Ghost poured out upon lost souls praise God we're going to work together as one body we will pray with one accord here in this altar I want everyone to seek God right now and I want us to ask God for revival to help us to live holy to help us to be consistent in prayer and fasting and to help us live holy lives and to preach the word wherever he would call us. Lift your hands and seek the Lord with me right now. I'm humbled by all that you've done. And even though I walk through the valley, Lord, anoint us, O oh God, to share your word, Jesus. Help us to walk in holiness and to be faithful you to you always. From a sorrow to the lands, I have you. What more could I want? So raise my faith a little higher. God set my spirit on fire. Oh, hallelujah. Yes, let's lift our hands tonight. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, Lord.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's give God a little glory. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight. I feel the Holy Ghost. Let's go ahead and love him. Come on, we're in no hurry. We ain't got nowhere to go. <clears throat> hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. Oh, we worship you. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Come on up here, son. Would you? Come on up here. What a, what a mighty message we've heard tonight. What a mighty message we've heard tonight. And uh, some, some years ago, I heard a, heard a message preached at a dedication. And the, and the minister preached. Jesus said, it is written, my house shall be called in a house of prayer to all people. But ye have made it a den of thieves. And then, and then he preached his dedication message. Make it what you will. The house of God will be what you make it. The house of God will be what you make it. And after what this man has preached tonight, I feel led of the Holy Ghost to say, we want to make this our upper room. I'm glad for the book of Acts, and I'm glad for 3,000 people receiving the Holy Ghost, but we got to have our upper room. And I'm not, I don't want to go back to Jerusalem to that upper room. I want to make this our upper room. When you come in, when you come into the house of God, I want you to come in saying, this is my upper room. Praise God. This is my place where the Holy Ghost is going to fall and meet with me. This is our upper rooms, Brother Scott. This is our upper room, Sister Amy. We don't have to go back to Jerusalem, but we can make it ours. Make it what you will. If you want the Holy Ghost to fall, then let it fall on you. Hallelujah. Would you join me? I want you to lift your hands and say, God, I choose to make this my upper room. I choose to make this the place where the Holy Ghost falls upon me. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now we're going to go home. But when we do, I want you to get in your mind. I want you to fix it in your thoughts. I'm going to be praying. And then when I get here the next time, I'm going to make this my upper room. I'm going to make this place a place where the Spirit falls. I want you to fix it in your mind. This is my upper room. I don't have to go back 2,000 years. Oh, hallelujah. I don't have to travel clear to Jerusalem. But here it is. God's given me this chance to make it my upper room. Would you lift your hands with me right now as we close? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Oh, God, you've given us our own upper room. Now pour out your spirit in it. Oh, oh, oh. Fill the house. Fill the house. Fill the house. Oh, oh, oh. Let, let the flame burn. The Holy Ghost fall. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, we glorify your mighty name. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We worship you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you all. We love you. Thank you for being here. Greek brothers and sisters, in Jesus' name, you're dismissed. <laughs>